Good afternoon. My name is Kareem Shashakli, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our webinar about the new features in Stella 2.0. There are many things that we've added, but by far the most innovative thing is an exciting thing is loops that matter, uh, which Billy Schoenberg has developed uh, for his PhD this, um, dissertation and uh, has then put into the Stella software for us. Billy is our lead developer, and he's here to tell us all about it. Thanks, Kareem. Yeah, so I'm pretty excited to talk to you all today about what's new in Stella 2.0. And I'm going to kind of run through uh, fairly quickly the, the full punch list of uh, what's new and what we've been working on. Um, and then we'll narrow in and focus in on what we're going to cover today. So the first thing, obviously, as Kareem alluded to, is loops that matter which is an automated way of doing uh, loop dominance analysis in SysDynamics models. Another cool new feature is uh, automatic diagram layout. Um, and this is pretty useful um, in uh, relationship to another one of our new features, which is the direct opening of Vensim models. So some Vensim models don't necessarily have uh, full uh, structural depictions of their uh, logic in terms of stocks and flows in, in diagrammatic elements. And so we can machine generate the missing pieces or even a full model diagram to give those models stock and flow diagrams. Also new in 2.0 is the ability to uh, automatically highlight non-negativity constraints. So if, for instance, you have a stock um, that is set to be non-negative, um, anytime one of the flow equations is being touched in order to make that true, we highlight it in bright yellow for you. Also new is the ability to display your model equations in a tabular format in the equation viewer. We've added two new uh, built-ins, lookup mean, which treats your lookup as a probability distribution function, and MLP ANN, which uh, stands for uh, multi-layer perceptron artificial neural network, so that you can set up neural nets inside of your SysDynamics models. We've also added uh, new distribution profiles for conveyor inflows, to allow you to vary, essentially, the kinds of the transit time through the conveyor. We've added features to the interface that uh, allow you to always have Stella Live beyond so that you can um, instantly launch into Stella Live mode and be re-stimulating, as well as an option to save to uh, disk the optimization log. What we're going to focus on today, though, is a smaller list of topics. Um, so using models like carrying capacity, fast diffusion, Forrester's market growth, and Nat Mass's economic cycles, which is a Vensim model, we're going to focus in on LTM. So we're going to interpret and use the animated stock and flow diagrams that are new in Stella 2.0. We're going to machine generate animated causal loop diagrams using Stella. And we're going to automatically simplify those machine generated CLDs to better expose the underlying feedback structure of our models. So I'm going to get started here and pull open Stella. And we're going to start here with a little carrying capacity example. Um, and as you'll notice right now, we don't actually have the you know, full carrying capacity part of it. We just have a simple population model, a bathtub population model, with births and deaths, a birth rate, and a reference lifetime. You'll notice that in the model settings, I've turned on the option called Calculate Loop Dominance Information. This is what enables LTM. When I hit the Run button, you'll now see that my diagram is coloring my flows and my connectors in strange ways. <laughs> you'll see that, for instance, um, some of these links are red, meaning reinforcing, meaning positive polarity. So we decorate the connectors with their polarity because we can algorithmically determine that. For instance, now we can look at the births flow and see that it is increasing the population. We can then look at the deaths flow, which is a balancing impact on population. And that's colored in blue for balancing. So from this, we can begin to see some of the feedback relationships that exist within our model. We highlight, or unhighlight, I can't think of the opposite of that word, downplay the connectors from constants and parameters to help focus people in on the dynamics of the model. In the panel on the right, called the loops panel, we can see a visualization 
of what's called the loop score, which tells us how important each loop is to determining the behavior of our model over time. So in this plot here on the top, this stacked area graph, you can see that I have two loops, B1 and R1, and that the reinforcing loop is dominant because it describes more than 50% of the behavior of this model over the entire time period of the model. If, for instance, we were to change something like the reference lifetime, we can see the impact that that has in real time on the loop dominance profile of our model. So when I set the reference lifetime to be small, like 11, we can now see that we have decline and that it is the balancing loop which is responsible for that. If we were ever curious as to what each one of these loops were, we can click on the highlight button in the loops table below, which will highlight that loop for us within the model so that we can easily identify it. We can also hover over the name of the loop to see what variables are involved within that loop. So if I wanted to complete the rest of this model and build it into a carrying capacity model so that I can examine the impact of carrying capacity loop on the behavior of this model, I would start by creating a variable called carrying capacity. And I'll set that to 500. And I believe the units in this model are critters. So I'm going to set it to 500 critters. Okay. Then what I need to do is create an effect, which will be the effect of carrying capacity on deaths. So as the population reaches the carrying capacity, we're going to cause extra critters to die. So we'll take the carrying capacity and hook it up to the effect of carrying capacity on deaths. We'll take the population, we'll also hook it up, and then we'll take the effect of carrying capacity on deaths and link that into deaths. So now I'm going to define the effect of carrying capacity on deaths. And I'm going to set it up such that it is population divided by the carrying capacity, which produces for us a dimensionless constant. I can then take that uh, dimensionless concept, constant and put it through a lookup table. And I've got my lookup table set up to go from 0 to 2 in the ratio of the population to the carrying capacity. And I want to set the output of the lookup table to go from 0 to 10. Then, using the lookup shape selector, I can choose an exponential curve. And I can adjust the curvature of it to be a bit more steep. This will show how that as the population grows larger and larger than the carrying capacity, the effect on deaths gets larger and larger in time with it. Now, all I need to do is hook up the effect of carrying capacity on deaths. And when I run this model, you'll see now that we have three feedback loops. We have R1, which is the births loop. We have B1, which is the effective carrying capacity on deaths. And then we have B2, which is the standard deaths loop. If I select all three of them, I can easily see how that when we reach equilibrium, we have um, a split between the reinforcing and balancing feedback loops. We can also see the impact of our lookup table on the results of the loop dominance. If we wanted that to go away and be a bit more smooth, we could make our lookup function be a smoother function. So we could add, for instance, 100 points into it and regenerate the curve to be a lot more smooth so that when we now run the model, we don't have that jagged behavior showing up as strongly. The other interesting thing that we can learn by playing with this model is that no matter what we do with the parameters of this model, it is always true that at the end of the simulation, when the model is in equilibrium, that the reinforcing and the sum of the two balancing loops are in equilibrium, each describing 50% of the behavior of the model.
So this is just one such example of how we can use LTM to inform our understanding of a, honestly, relatively simple model. If we continue on to the Bass Diffusion model, we can explore some of the other tools within the LTM toolset. So I'm going to simulate this model here, and you can see over time how the loop dominance shifts by just looking at the stock and flow diagram. If I scrub back in the time slider, we can see that initially the adopting loop is strongest as all of its connectors are thick. If I go to the end of this model, you know, towards the end of the time period, we can see how the balancing loop now is dominant because all of its connections are thick. The thicker the arrow, the stronger the relationship between the dependent and uh, between the independent and dependent variables. If I go to the inflection point, where both loops are approximately equal in strength, we can see that in the visualization we get two loops that appear to be approximately equal in strength. When we look at this in the stacked area chart, we can see the common understanding of this model portrayed for us, that there is a smooth and continuous shift between the reinforcing feedback loop and the balancing feedback loop. But let's say, for instance, I wanted to machine generate a CLD of this model to help better uh, understand and explain the dynamics. I can click on this button over here, and it now machine generates for me a CLD of this model. I can also animate this CLD in exactly the same way that I was able to animate the stock and flow diagram. You'll now see that in the loops panel, we have some new parameters, which let us control what the CLD looks like. So this first one on the top it allows us to show the link strength at the chosen point in time. If I uncheck this, it now presents a more static image of the dynamics of the model, where all the connectors have an equal thickness and the polarity is signified by both color and symbol. I'm gonna skip over for a moment this automatically keep the flows of each kept stock checkbox and first talk about the loop inclusion threshold. The loop inclusion threshold determines which stocks and flows are kept because they're a member of a strong feedback loop. As I push this further and further to the right, what I'm doing is I'm filtering, although in this case, I'm not filtering anything, the stocks and flows that are automatically kept because of the strength of the loop that they're involved in. So this setting, it says, keep only the stocks and the flows of any feedback loop, which describes at least 63.887% of this model's behavior. The reason why nothing is disappearing is because I have the link inclusion threshold set at zero. So let me reset um, the loop inclusion threshold to something like 36%. As I move the link inclusion threshold, what it does is it begins to remove any variable who is pointed to by a link where the strength of the link doesn't change very much over the course of the simulation. What we're interested in seeing in our causal loop diagrams are links which are highly variable, links whose strength changes over the course of the simulation. Links which are always and fully explanatory are boring. Those are variables that are, for instance, involved in simple mathematical equations. For instance, like the potential adopters effect on the probability of contact with potentials. If I jump back to the stock and flow diagram and look at that um, link, you'll see that there's only one dynamic variable which affects the probability of contact with potentials, that is, the potential adopters. So this variable isn't necessarily critical to the understanding of the model. When I jump back into this view and I remove those links, you see that all of the other constants or equations which um, only have one dynamic cause disappear. If I push the link inclusion threshold all the way over 100%, that says don't keep anything except for the stocks and flows of the system. If I then push the, link the loop inclusion threshold higher up the scale, you'll see that it's dropped out the other half of this system. We've dropped out the balancing feedback loop.
And why have we done that? Because the loop inclusion threshold is filtering on the total loop score over the entire time period of the simulation. And because the inflection point in this model is closer to the end of this model, we end up dropping out the balancing feedback loop. If we go into the simplified loops tab, it shows us that we only have a single feedback loop being displayed, R1, and that this, model, and that this CLD is only describing 64% of our model's behavior. So we know that this is probably not a very accurate CLD. But when we push it back to include both feedback loops, we're now capable of explaining 100% of the dynamic complexity of this model. So before we continue and begin to analyze more complex models, I'd like to pause and take some questions about LTM. Hey, Billy, um, this, this loop stuff, this CLD drawing, everybody thinks this is kind of cool, um, but they want to know how they're going to use, how are they going to use this LTM stuff on a day-to-day -day basis when they're building their models? To What's this loop dominance really going to help them with? So this loop dominance stuff is very useful for understanding the um, progression of feedback loop dominance within your model. And if I were to jump back into PowerPoint for a second here, oh, I don't have it. Um, I'll stick into Stella. Um, what this feedback loop dominant stuff is all about is understanding where behavior in your model comes from. So um, what we're interested in when we're using this loop uh, dominance information, when we're using LTM, is kind of figuring out um, where and why, uh, so really why our models are behaving the way that they do, and then where within that model that behavior is responsible. So for instance, if we were only interested in studying a certain portion of the model's behavior, so let's say I run this model and take a look at adopters, and I'm only interested about the feedback in this period of the model, I can limit the time range and then come to the loops panel and see what loops are impactful in that time period. And we can see from time zero to time 5.625, 99.9% 9 of the model's behavior is coming from the reinforcing feedback loop, and only 0.04% of the model's behavior is coming from the balancing feedback loop. Thank you, Billy. Can LTM highlight uh, pairs of loops that are shadowing each other? Yes. In fact, um, in the final example that I'm going to go through today, the economic cycles model, um, we're going to actually end up seeing a whole bunch of feedback loops which directly cancel each other out. You can use the highlight button, obviously, to always see where the loop is within the structure. So if, for instance, we're looking at it in a CLD, we can see the same thing um, in the CLD mode as well. Uh, but there are going to be some feedback loops which... Um, are perfectly uh, diametrically opposed and actually cancel each other out. And LTM will make it easy to see those loops by looking at their total impact over the entire time range of the simulation. So if you wait for just a few minutes, I'll show you a good example of that. Thank you. And could you walk through the definitions of the link and loop inclusions again? Certainly. So there are two parameters um, that we use to determine what variables show up within the CLD. The first is the loop inclusion threshold. And this process is based upon filtering the variables within the model and then redrawing the connections while staying true to the feedback structure of the model. So right now I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven variables. Um, and I want to limit the cognitive complexity of my diagram. So I want to remove some of them so that I have a simpler diagram. To do that, I need to determine which to remove. So there are two ways that I can remove variables. I can remove variables that are boring, uh, you know, I put that in air quotes, because they're impacted by variables, by just a single variable which changes. For instance, like the probability of contact with potentials. You could imagine drawing one link directly from potential adopters to potential contact with adopters. You're not losing any information. So by increasing the link inclusion threshold, what I'm doing is, is I'm filtering out 
those variables, like the adopter contacts or adoption from uh, word of mouth, um, which aren't necessarily adding to the explanation of the behavior of the model. So the link inclusion threshold is often used to filter out converters. The loop inclusion threshold is used to filter out stocks and flows potentially um, in larger models where there are certain stocks which aren't impactful to the feedback dynamics of the model. The loop inclusion threshold specifies what stocks and flows should be kept in the resulting CLD based upon the impact that they have on the behavior of the model as a whole. Thank you, Billy. <clears throat> There's one last question. Are we talking about identifying leverage points? Not necessarily. Um, what we're mostly talking about is identifying the feedback loops, um, which describe the changes in the flows, which of course change the stocks. Um, the leverage points would then come from parameters that impact those feedback loops. Um, and for those of you who are familiar um, with the, this subsection of the system dynamics field, um, you'll know that uh, there's something called eigenvalue elasticity analysis, which is another way of doing this kind of same thing, although a lot more complicated. Um, and that has within its umbrella of technologies called uh, dynamic uh, decomposition weight analysis, DDWA, um, which is uh, really targeted at finding um, leverage points. Uh, LTM doesn't necessarily have an analog um, to, uh, to DDWA yet. Thank you, Billy. All right. So why don't we continue? Let's take a look at a little bit more of a complex model. Let's look at something like uh, Forrester's market growth model. And what's pretty neat about this model is that it includes a macro, a delay three built in, which is of course composed of a whole set of stocks and flows and connectors of its own. So one of the neat things about LTM is that it's capable of running on pretty much any model that you can build within Stella, including those with macros or discrete elements like queues and conveyors and ovens and things of that nature. So LTM is very, very broadly applicable. So if I run this model, and I'm going to set this in duration to something like five seconds, and we look at it here, we can see I've got a whole bunch of links flashing at me like mad. I don't know about you, but that's pretty much unintelligible to me. I'm not smart enough to make something out of that picture. I need to generate a CLD, which is kind of at my level of ability to understand. So I'm going to jump into the CLD view. Now, I'm going to show you my favorite technique for filtering the dynamic complexity of models down into something that is understandable. If I were to, for instance, push both of these parameters all the way to the left, you'll see that I end up with a diagram that has every single variable in this model. You know, this isn't necessarily super helpful to me. And if I push both of these parameters all the way to the right, I end up with nothing. I filtered everything out of the diagram. Well, and if I look at the simplified loops here, and I'm just gonna hide the graph for a moment, you'll see that I've explained no portion of the behavior of this model. So I like to start from this picture where I've described nothing. And I like to start by pulling the loop inclusion threshold down until I've gotten to a pretty high portion of the model's behavior being explained. In this case, 86% of the model's behavior. And you'll see that I end up with these two gray links and two loops unknown polarity one and R1. What's up with that unknown polarity stuff? Forrester's model doesn't have any links with unknown polarity in them. Well, if we hover over these links, you can see an explanation. It's telling us that this link is either oversimplified or contains a link which changes polarity. And because we know that this model doesn't have any links which change polarity, because we can look at the all loops table and see that there are no unknown polarity loops within this model, we know that we've oversimplified the causal process 
between, for instance, the current capacity and the shipment rate, and the sales force and the order rate, meaning there are multiple causal pathways with differing polarities that we can take for the, from the sales force to the order rate or from current capacity to the shipment rate. To disentangle those, we can play with the leak inclusion, thre uh, the leak inclusion threshold, uh, and we can pull it down in steps. So the first step I pull it down expands this gray link between the current capacity and the shipment rate. If you watch closely, you'll see that that link breaks up into a series of multiple variables. For instance, the current capacity can affect the shipment rate directly, or the current capacity can affect the capacity utilization, which then goes on to affect the shipment rate. One of those is reinforcing current capacity to shipment rate directly. The other, balancing. This is why we had oversimplified the link that goes directly from current capacity to the shipment rate. It included both a reinforcing and a balancing process. If we continue to pull the link inclusion threshold back, you'll see that we expand now the link between the sales force and the order rate. If we pay close attention, we can see that that expands out to include the sales effectiveness. Now, the typical explanation for this model relies on the understanding that there's a reinforcing feedback loop that exists between recent revenue, sales force, and the backlog, and that all of the other loops in this model relating to capacity or delivery delay affect that core reinforcing feedback loop. Well, I'd like to challenge that way of thinking. Let's see if LTM brings us to the same understanding of the system. Hold on, let me just uh, regenerate that. Okay, so if, for instance, we begin to look here at the first feedback loop, we see that uh, it explains 30% of the behavior of this model over the entire time period. So it's pretty important feedback loop. And it goes from the shipment rate to the recent revenue, to the sales force, to the order rate, to the backlog, to the delivery delay, into capacity, back into the shipment rate. So that's the most important concept or feedback structure within this model. And then if we look at the balancing loop, that is number two in the list, the second most impactful feedback loop, we see that it is exactly the same loop, except it takes a pathway from sales force to order rate through sales effectiveness. So we now know that the sales effectiveness concept is pretty important to the dynamics of the behavior under this parameterization of the model. And that's key here. LTM analyzes the model for the set of constants and parameters and lookup tables that you have given it for the run that you're looking at. LTM is not capable of telling you which feedback loops in the abstract sense are least and most important. You would need to look at your model under many different combinations of parameters to get an understanding of the general feedback loop strength of any individual feedback loop within your model. The next feedback loop here is the capacity loop. And if I pull this um, graph down and take a look, um, we can see something pretty interesting about this capacity loop. It's only important in the beginning portion of the model. In the later time periods, when this model is reaching towards equilibrium, the capacity loop isn't nearly as important. In fact, it's pretty much not important at all. If I look at the next feedback loop, we can see that uh, it's a reinforcing feedback loop like the um, R1 and B1. Well, not like B1 in that it's reinforcing, but like B1 that it goes through sales effectiveness. But it takes a different pathway from current capacity to shipment rate through capacity utilization. And as we continue, we'll see that the next most impactful feedback loop is related to the delivery delay perceived by the company. If we were to continue to click through all of these feedback loops, we would never find that core feedback loop that goes from the sales force to the order rate, to the backlog, to the change in recent revenue, to the recent revenue. That link from the backlog 
um, into um, recent revenue is never actually impactful enough to matter. That core feedback loop, that core reinforcing feedback loop, while physically present within the structure, is never expressed in such a way as to make it important. What is important, though, are things like the sales effectiveness, the delivery delay, and early on, the current capacity and the capacity building structure within this model. So LTM is capable of leading us to new insights into this, you know, reasonably well understood model in the past. So in that sense, LTM is really kind of helpful to give us an objective measure of what's happening in our model. And we can do it fairly quickly. What I'd like to do next is give you an example of an analysis of a more complex model. And the more complex model I want to analyze is the economic cycles by Nat Mass, which is actually a Vensim model. And you'll notice that when I've opened this model in the file picker, I can choose an Vensim MDL file. And uh, if we give my computer a second here, um, I'll be able to open that up. There we go. And you'll see here that we've translated that Vensim model automatically into a Stella model. And we've algorithmically generated any of the missing variables that weren't there. If we look here, we bring in this model using the concept of Stella sectors to replicate the Vensim sectors. The stock and flow structure is preserved, and while it isn't perfectly beautiful, it is functional enough for us to do the work that we need. So what we want to do here is we want to calculate the loop dominance again. So we're going to enable that. I can then hit run, and you can see that I get a pattern of behavior. And if we wanted to know, for instance, how many feedback loops um, were existent within this model that are active at any point in time, and even the smallest amount um, within this uh, set of parameters, we can scroll down to the bottom of the all loops list and see that there are 494 feedback loops in this model. So, a relatively complex model. So now, what I want to do, because clearly this model is unanalyzable by looking at the stock and flow diagram, is jump into the CLD view. And if I were to take a look at uh, some of the behavior of this model in the results panel, you'll see that this model is an oscillator. And I've studied this model before, and so I know that uh, the period of this oscillation, this second one here, is from approximately time 5 to approximately time 9. So rather than study the behavior of this model across all of the oscillations, I'm going to study a single cycle of this model. To do that, what I need to do is adjust the time range. So I'm going to start and drag this um, time range slider down so that I'm analyzing stopping at around time nine. I'm gonna get it reasonably close. I don't need to be perfect. I'm gonna go a little further than that. Okay, good enough. And then I wanna start at approximately time five. Close enough. All right, so now I'm going to apply the same technique that we used the last time, where we start with a diagram that shows absolutely nothing, and I'm going to switch to the simplified loops table so that we can see this total behavior explained. And then I'm going to bring back the loop inclusion threshold until I get to a reasonable portion of the model's behavior being explained. I get to about 58, 60%. And that's good enough for right now. But what you see is I end up with what is still a pretty complex diagram because it's got a lot of variables in it. But in terms of the feedback loop complexity, it's not really there. And if I were to look closely at all of these variables that are being included here, you'll notice that they're all flows. Well, 
the loop inclusion threshold automatically keeps the stocks and the flows of each kept stock of any of the most impactful feedback loops. If I uncheck this parameter, what it does is it removes those stocks. I mean, excuse me, it removes those flows. They aren't automatically kept unless they meet the link inclusion threshold, which I've set to be over 100%, which means none of them are kept. And so now I end up with a diagram that explains 58.5% of this model's behavior. And if I continue to drag this um, back, you see here that I can get to like 62% or you know, 69%, but then I get even more, you know, feedback complexity here. I end up with 12 loops. Um, you know, I can keep going, but I end up, you know, with a gnarled mess. So it's not that you're always ending up with, you know, something in the 80s. Um, in this case, you know, something in the 60s might be adequate to explaining the behavior of this model. Let's take a look and see if this diagram is useful to understanding the complexity of this model. And so you might say to me, well, Billy, you've got one of these unknown polarity links here. Why can't you use the link inclusion threshold to remove it? Well, what happens when I do that is I start including more variables and more links, and I turn the diagram into another gnarled mess. So if I look closely at this link, you'll notice the only place where it matters and I put that in big air quotes, is in this loop U1, which describes over the entire simulation period, or over the entire um, analysis period, 0.02% of the behavior. I'm not super concerned about this link or this loop. 0.02% of the model's behavior in this time range is frankly not impactful or relevant at all. I tend not to look at any of the loops that get picked up unless they're greater than a handful of percents. This 3% loop is really the minimum of what I would consider a loop that matters. So let's start from the top. The most important loop that it identifies, uh, that LTM identifies, is this B1 with four stocks. Backlog, affecting vacancies, affecting labor, affecting inventory, affecting the backlog. This makes sense because we see an oscillatory pattern and we know that oscillations can come from two feed, uh, from uh, a balancing feedback loop. If we look at the next loop, we see here that it's you know the inventory affecting the backlog, affecting labor, affecting inventory. Reasonable, I can accept that. And if I look at the next feedback loop, you'll see that it's more complex and it takes a pathway from the perceived rate of increase in price to inventory to vacancies. And if I look at this feedback loop, whoa, they're very similar. They just take a slightly different pathway between the perceived rate of increase in price and the vacancies. But then it gets even weirder. I look at the totals and I see that they both are describing 5.31% of this model's behavior. One's reinforcing and one's balancing. And at this point in time, they describe exactly equal portions of the model's behavior. That's weird. And if I select both of these loops and look at them in a line graph, unscaled, you'll notice that they perfectly contradict each other. These two loops cancel each other out. As if these two loops made no impact. So this 61.6 uh, metric is really um, something a bit higher because these loops are counting and consuming behavior explained, even though ultimately together as a pair, they cancel each other. And if I go back into the all loops table and begin to look at all the feedback loops in this model, we begin to notice that there are a lot of these twins. There's B3, and R1, they cancel each other out. There's B5 and R2. There's B6 and R3, 
There's B8 and R4. There's R5 and B9. R6 and B10. There's R7, B11. Most of the feedback loops in this model are actually twins that are canceling each other out over time. And so when we go back and we take a look at this simplified diagram, we actually realize that we end up with a pretty good overall picture of the feedback that actually matters, the feedback that's actually responsible for creating the behavior that we see. So even though this model has reinforcing feedback within it, almost all of the time it's being canceled out by a perfectly opposing balancing feedback loop leaving this model to be dominated by a series of mainly two balancing feedback loops, this B1 and this B2. And so this is how we can use LTM to better understand even more complex models. And at this point, we've covered all of the parameters within the loops panel, as well as how to generate these CLDs and analyze them. At this point, I'd like to pause and ask for any questions. Hey, Billy. Um, when you were doing the market growth, someone asked why you first reduced, uh, why you increased the loop inclusion threshold before the link inclusion threshold. That's just habit. Um, the order in which you do them has no effect um, on uh, the result that you get. So if I go back uh, to uh, the market growth model, oh, you were talking about it in the context of fast diffusion? No, it was in the market growth model, okay. but it doesn't Sorry. matter. Um, uh, market growth, that's just when you, you they, they notice you did that. Right, so uh, if I filter this way and then this way, I get to nothing. And if I filter it the other way, I still get to nothing. Um, there's no order or implicit order of operations here. Um, I like to start from blank and pull the loop inclusion threshold so that I end up with the most impactful feedback loops by default. But there's another potentially useful strategy, which has you pull the link inclusion threshold back in order to see um, pictures of what are the most variable feedback loops over the course of the simulation. So I can very quickly here get to a set of feedback loops that describe you know, a huge portion of this model's behavior. But um, I've introduced a whole lot of oversimplified um, feedback loops. And it isn't until I begin to back this off even further that I can end up with a picture that includes only the converters um, and some of the flows, um, which gives me a, uh, a reasonable picture of the dynamic complexity of this model. But I prefer to think of and look at the system from its stocks if I'm capable of it. If I can't find a nice explanatory diagram using this technique, I might go the other way because there might be a diagram in there that's helpful. But people tend to think of the system from its stocks as opposed to from its converters. Thank you, Billy. Um, someone was running into a problem where they couldn't see uh, the loop dominance happening when they ran the uh, model. OK, so sometimes you might not have what's called calculate loop dominance information checked off. In models of a certain size um, that have been brought in from older versions of the software, or from Bensim, um, we'll turn this off because it can impact, in fact, it does impact um, your simulation speed. Um, this becomes pretty noticeable in large models. So if you aren't seeing, when you run your model, all of these colored connectors, make sure that you've turned on calculate loop dominance information. In order to make sure that you see the animation, Make sure that you've set a sim duration of at least a handful of seconds so that the animation has time to play out. Thank you, Billy. Um, the last question is, can we give the loops names? Certainly. 
So let's take, for instance, um, the, uh, the Bass Diffusion model. And let's just restore everything back and run. You'll notice that in, um, oops, wrong button. All right, you'll notice that in um, the loops table, when we're in the stock and flow diagram, we have this um, other button over here, which allows us to create what's called a loop score variable for the loop R1. So when I click that, it changes my cursor into a little converter that I can place, which is a loop score variable, which is named R1. I can change that and call that my adopting loop. And now when I run this model and I look in the loops table, it's called adopting loop. And when I hover over this variable, it highlights that loop for me. Another very useful piece of um, analysis that we can do with a variable like this is actually to include it within a sensitivity analysis. Um, I'm going to assume that there are no more questions, Kareem. No, there aren't right now. Oh, wait, there is a new one. But uh, the next one is whether it works in the interface. OK, so I'm going to hold uh, the interface question for a second. I'm going to very quickly demonstrate um, doing a uh, sensitivity analysis on the loop strength. So if you remember, I uh, talked about how um, these loop scores are only shown to you for under a single set of parameters. So if I wanted to, I could very quickly remove potential adopters from this graph, make it comparative, um, restore all devices, and very quickly set up a sensitivity analysis where I change the contact rate from, let's see, uh, 100. OK. So where I change the contact rate um, from, let's call it 50 to 200. Um, and we'll do it over 10 runs. OK. And now when I run, you can see that I get you know 10 different behaviors for adopters. And if I plot this adopting loop comparatively, you can see that I can see now how the loop dominance changes when uh, essentially the inflection point moves, that, that it's always true under all of these different conditions of contact rate. So I can see that when I have um, the inflection point earlier on, um, that uh, the reinforcing loop loses its power more quickly versus when it's later, it loses its power um, over a much uh, slower period of time. The next question was about LTM on the interface. So up on the interface, we have what's called a model view widget. The model view widget is a picture of the uh, essentially stock and flow structure of your model. And I'm going to change um, some of the visible structure that's here. I'm just going to remove the adopters graph and that sensitivity graph so that they're not visible. And you'll notice that in the panel here, I can check off show link animations and show the loop table. And this will allow you to put this LTM style information for the stock and flow diagram on your interface. Unfortunately, as of yet, we haven't built in the capability of algorithmically generating CLDs within your interface. And does this carry over when you publish, Billy? Yes, it does. So I could take this interface and I could publish it to the web and then I could distribute an interface with this information in it and this animation in it um, to anybody who's got a modern web browser um, who could run it on anything from a laptop to a Chromebook to an iPad to a mobile phone. Thank you, Billy. Um, there's one comment here that says this is a fantastic tool for decision making. And this is all pretty cool. That's it for comments and questions. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, everybody, uh, for coming and participating in this webinar today. Um, if at any point you have any questions or uh, concerns, please feel free to email uh, support or myself, um, and we'd be more than happy to help you with anything that we can. Thank you.